Okay. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, sir. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to be seen. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. True indeed. True indeed. So um, I'm going to begin our conversation by asking you just a little bit about yourself that uh, you think might be interesting or necessary for people to know you just a little bit better. Okay. First of all, uh, I'm retired clinically as a nurse. I've been a nurse for 50 years, and now I've decided to uh, work more on the holistic preventative side. And I do that through uh, coaching, through net wellness and lifestyle coaching. And I do that under my company, well, not a company, but I call it living from the wheel. It's really a food wheel. Mm -hmm. I, I am also, as I said, I, I, I work with Dr. Norma Hollis. Now, Dr. Norma Hollis is a leader in human professional development arena, and we call her the godmother of authenticity. And when you're dealing with authenticity, it's a way of using the nine dimensions that she found in her grid. And it's about making a more rewarding and successful life. And when you deal in the corporate side, it's really about transformational leadership. And so I work with her and I am a facilitator for at least two of of the courses that come out of the Norma Hollis group. Mm -hmm. Is her name Norma Hollis? Yes, Dr. Norma Hollis. Okay, great. Yes, she's from Inglewood, California. All right. Mm -hmm. That's what I do. I am a follower of the Muslim Elijah Muhammad mm -hmm. under Louis Farrakhan. Mm -hmm. And I was I don't know how you appeared in my feed, but it was just something. I was reading this book called The Alphabet versus the Goddess. Have you heard of that? I think I have years ago. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's about uh, the conflict between words and images. Okay. And his theory is that writing in its alphabetic form diminishes the feminine val value mm. uh, and people who write in pictures such as in ancient Kemet um, they tend to use their right brain but we know that they use both sides of their brain because they were very great mathematicians and in engineers yeah. in addition to writing all of those uh, the images, the picture writing. I, I I don't know what it's called. I can't, well, I can't remember what it's called. Yeah. But uh, yes. Yeah. They usually use the term pictographs. Yeah. Okay. Pictographs. Yeah. Ancient Egypt good. used, uh, the, the Greeks called the ancient Egyptian writing hieroglyphs. Mm -hmm. But in the regular English vernacular, they would be pictographs. It means exactly the same thing. Hiero means picture. Uh, you know, glyph means graph, which is picture. Or writing part of me, um, yeah. The glyph part is the is the writing part, mm -hmm. but they mean the same thing basically, yeah. Okay. But you're making a very serious and important set of points here that actually point back to some things I said last night on the webinar. I don't know if you got a chance to hear that. Yes, I did. Okay, okay. So that's right on point. Yeah, continue. This is okay, exciting. So, so I've been interested in words language and and I said you know when I saw you and you were talking about well you talked about a lot of different things because I I tuned into you several times mm -hmm. and I said you know this is a, a, amazing this is just what I like it's about delving into really what words and in your case letters what they really mean and that made the hairs on my arm stand on end. Uh -huh. There's certain things that you say about letters. So this one recently, when you were speaking to 
Adam Ambush. Yes. I think his name is Adam. Yes, yeah, he's been getting and a lot of good feedback. And we're talking about yeah. the word haggle and yeah. going and um, mm -hmm. Agar going back and forth, back yes. and going back and forth, back. Yeah, I'm sorry, give me just one moment. I'm having a little problem with my camera. Give me just one second. Okay, that should have rectified the problem. Continue, please. Okay, so I thought it was so fascinating. Just something like that. Yeah. Going back and forth and then the haggling coming from the same or, or origin. Who would think about, who would have thought of that? So unless you already know. Yeah. And then as you can see, I love Star Trek, so... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I love the mythology of going into uh, of the auto space. So yeah, I love it. This is wonderful. Anything you want to say about your family, your immediate family, or are you married with I have children, six, or yada yada? I my husband is deceased. Okay, I have six <laughs> grandchildren from two children. I have All a right. son and a daughter. Mm -hmm. And so from between the two of them, there are six grandchildren. Okay. And I live in Texas. I live in a place called Cedar Hill. But because I live in Dallas County, I just generally tell people I'm from Dallas. Right. We, just well, we, have, we have a few yeah. few learners out there. Yeah. At least four or five. Think. Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Between Houston and Dallas, we have them. Yes. And maybe I think another part of Texas that I'm not remembering, but... Uh, I've entertained the idea of of visiting Texas, yeah, uh, for purposes of probably having a house there, not permanently, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. that I could just go to when I need to go to it. I've heard so many wonderful things about Texas, and it it's, it's, it's it's kind yeah. of in a flux right now in terms of the politics. But um, I'm waiting to see what happens when the dust actually settles. Yes, as I was going to say, it has its stories, and. Uh, <laughs> I live in North Texas. At one time, it was called the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. Mm -hmm. But I think now it's just called North Dallas because there's so many little cities. I think that anchor cities are, of course, Dallas and Fort Worth and then all of those small places, incorporated areas and small towns around around those anchor cities. All right. And what do you do for relaxation? Relaxation. <laughs> yeah. You remember that word? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, busy people like us, relaxation is not even in our dictionary. <laughs> I live in a 55 active community. Mm -hmm. And what we usually do that kind of helps me relax. You mean 55 years and older? Yes. Yeah. So how did you sneak in there? How did I sneak in there? As young well, as you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, they didn't have to card me. So, <laughs> so in, anyway, so I, we usually go downstairs and, and, and we talk about what we're going, going to do. <clears throat> and usually that usually relaxes me, but reading, I do a lot of reading that helps to relax me. Mm. I love listening to music. Yeah. The old uh, rhythm and blues. All right. You know, my, my genre. Yeah. Yeah. My genre. <laughs> Mine also. It. Yeah. 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 Great. So I love it. And then I'm currently reading this book called Black Angels. And it's yeah. about something. Amir Fatir. Well, no, that no? one, this one, this one is about some black nurses from mm -hmm. the 1930s until I think the 1960s that they were working in this Seaview hospital that was for people that had tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. And it talks about their journey and how they helped in, how they were instrumental in dealing with uh, tuberculosis. All right. for all My wife things. would be very interested in that book. Yes, it's called The Black Angels by Maria Smilios. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll check. Uh, I'll check around online and see if I can find that. But, she, she, yeah, she would be very interested in that. Anything that has to do with sickness and wellness, <laughs> um, 
I get the one she's reading now. Uh, she looks at books, reads books that have to deal with the death process. Oh, which she finds anthology? absolutely. I'm I'm not remembering what the name of the science okay. is, mm -hmm. but uh, it's just what happens when when the death process begins to overtake the body and that kind of thing. Oh, okay. um, yeah, it, it's a little macabre to me, but mm -hmm. that's her that's her interest. You know what do people do in the morgue. What happens in the in the morgue? In the morgue, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, all of it is a part of the sciences created by Allah. You know, we tend to divide these things up into mm -hmm. scary and fearful mm -hmm. and spooky and all of that. But according to the fitrah, all of it is just a part of the natural processes, as I mentioned, of generation, operation, and dissolution. So death is the dissolution stage for the body in that case, but it doesn't have to be for the soul. Mm -hmm. Okay. I get it. That's something I also study. Science. I study dianetics. Mm -hmm. Well, as you know, it's part of science. I study that. And that sounds very like something like that we call, that's called uh, a cycle of actions. You start and you continue and then you stop. Or you start and then there's growth and then there's stop. Mm -hmm. That's a complete cycle of action. I said, that sounds just like what Benjamin Bilal was talking about. Yeah, talked about yeah, yeah. The G. Those, those three oh, stages e. are, are, those three stages are replete throughout nature. Mm -hmm. yes, you know, right. and it's what's called in language a verb. A verb always has a starting point. Mm -hmm. It has an apex and it has a diminishing because it's an action. So okay. these things, uh, we we come up with our own terms for these things, you know, Dianetics and Nunetics and uh, learning language and all of this, but it re really is just a reflection of what Allah has already done as the master creator by giving us generation, operation, and destruction for everything created. The only thing that does not die is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything else in the created world has to experience those three processes in that order. The infant comes in, generation. That baby, boy or girl, is generated through sperm and ovum, et cetera, et cetera. You know, bet, you know better than I do, right? And uh, then the child grows to be what the Quran calls uh, grows up to its full strength and then that strength as Allah says in the Quran begins to diminish to the point where people can get dementia I mean a whole lot of things can happen from from that point on so it's the cycle of life I think that's what the Lion King movie called it the cycle of life or something like that so all of us are going through it the idea is just to prepare to reap the best rewards from each one of those sections of life so we don't have to become despondent and depressed as we grow older. You know, we don't have to become uh, ill to the point where we we can't do things independently of other people who have to assist us. Uh, it does, we, we're going to need some assistance because that's what weakness brings. But there are some people who grow to be, my, my grandmother died at uh, 102 and she, no cane, no wheelchair, no nothing, nobody holding on to her. Well, she walked up and down her steps mm -hmm. every day, mm -hmm. still in her yard, planting her, her greens and whatever else that she was doing back there. And uh, she grew to be, uh, as I said, 102 years old. So a lot of um, the conditions that we're dealing with are actually conditions of the mind. And if we learn how to master the mind, we create circumstances for ourselves where we re retain and maintain that mastership. And I know within your paradigm, you know, the word master is a very important word. Oh, oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> master teacher. Yeah, you understand? So, um, <clears throat> and uh, the word master itself actually is... <clears throat> A combination of two ideas and that is if you remove the m m has its own distinct meaning being the 13th letter in the english alphabet so 13 means leadership if you look at the 
jury in the court, <clears throat> they have 12 jurors, <clears throat> but the judge becomes the 13th. The judge is the master over the jurors. He's got the knowledge. He's got the lock on, on how the process actually operates. When you look even in the Bible, when it comes to Jesus, Jesus had 13 disciples, uh, had 12 disciples, and he made the, the 13th. He was the leader over the 12. So 13, practically wherever you see it, is representative of leadership. I noticed when I was living in New York, you know, amongst those tall buildings, that many of them omitted a 13th floor. And I heard from that point that it was because many people believed that 13 was an unlucky number, as they called it, the unlucky 13, you know. But I grew to understand through my own self-study that the reason some people were considering 13 to be unlucky is because it represents leadership. And these are people who don't want leadership. <laughs> the leadership becomes dangerous to them. If they're trying to get you to do something nefarious or try to get you to think in a way that's not really conducive to you or for you, they can't, have, they can't afford to have you thinking that way. They have to be your leader. So they want you, the 12 is fine, but once you add a 13th who is leading or ruling or mastering over the 12, then that becomes a problem for the people who want to rule your life. So uh, the people who guide us as leaders and teachers, and again, the Nation of Islam is a very good example of that experience where a leader is guiding others beneath him uh, in certain ways to provide light amongst darkness. So we call that light star, not the sun. The sun is not uh, guiding us in darkness. It's taking us completely out of darkness for a moment, right? But the stars are guiding us in the dark and people had to make their way along very long journeys or, or, or across waters and oceans. And they did it by following the patterns of the stars. So the word master is a combination of the letter M, which means a leader or leadership, and aster, which means star. So the master is the leader of the stars. Now, if you're not a star, get out of that group. <laughs> if you're not looking to be a star, one who, who, who is able to guide others in the darkness, then you don't belong in that group. You just want to be a sheep with the sheeple. You know, there's a lot of sheeple people okay. who just, you know, they don't know what to follow until until the wolf shows up. <laughs> so um, I said that also to just help to broaden the thinking of people who have certain prejudices against um, groups and organizations. I mean, all of us have our weaknesses and all of us have our, our other side. Uh, and all of us have our mistakes that we're making. But I try not to judge the mistake as the person. I try not to judge the, the language that I'm disagreeing with. I try not to judge the person, the human that Allah created, that Allah created to be most excellent. I try not to judge the human by the mistake. There's something that my wife taught me about six years ago now. She said, life is a running video. Do not judge it by its snapshots. Great advice. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody does something that we don't like and we take a snapshot of it in our mind. And we always remember that every time we see that person. So even though that person has changed, which life demands, you know, that we all change and grow and think differently. But if you're not actively engaged in conversation, with that person or with that group of people, you might tend to think that that's exactly where they still are. You know, we have that problem when it comes to racism. Mm -hmm. The way so-called white people were during the slavery days and the Jim Crow days, many of us, especially our parents and grandparents, they took a snapshot of that and they passed that attitude down to us so that now we don't trust any white people. <laughs> We don't trust white people because grandma talked about the time and experience under the tree when, the, you know, so we have to be able to look at this information and reassess where that information should be situated in our psychic makeup. Because sometimes when you go over something consistently, 
and your intellect continues to pay attention to it, as I've always said, anything you pay attention to expands. So the reason many of us are not making progress as a people is because we still have implanted into our psyche and uh, pardon me for one moment. We still have implanted into our psyche that this man has so much power over us and there's, he's crushing us and there's nothing we can do to, to, to stave off his authority over us. So we just become despondent and he becomes bigger because we're giving him our attention. So sometimes the answer is to stop paying attention to it. Doesn't mean that it disappears, but it means that it does not become your central focus and it does not dominate your mind and your emotions and how you react instinctively. And it causes many of us, sorry to give you this short little psychology lesson, but it, it causes most of us to reduce ourselves down to the instinctive brain, to the reptilian brain, where mm -hmm. fight or flight is always the issue. I'll fight if I can beat it. I'll flee to live another day to try to come back and beat it because I'm not capable right now. So if we're reducing ourselves to reptilian impulses is what they're called, the impulses of the reptilian brain, the fight or flight brain, the instinctive drives, the survival brain, if we're always under the threat that our mortal lives are in danger because of these people, then those people become giants. Inadvertently, they become giants in our life to the point where our every other sentence is about those people. Well, the white man won't let us, and the white man did this, and the white people, and the white children, and the white babies, and all of them are devils. <laughs> we give them too much, we give them too much credibility. They're humans like we are, born of the same stuff. And their skin colors, their complexions had nothing to do with who they turned out to be, humanly speaking. Their environmental conditioning created the circumstances that we're seeing in the world now. That's why you can find some who are great human beings, so-called white people. Dr. Omar Zaid, who I confer with, I forget that he's white. And I don't I don't even like the terms black and white for people. But so but you you understand for purposes of, of our audience understanding what we're talking about. I forget. I forget that he's, you know, that he's even in that in that category. And I have a lot of other people. I've had teachers. I've had principals of my schools that have been wonderful to me, much more wonderful than people who look like me. <laughs> so I don't use those color labels. I think they're primitive. Jim, give me your give me your spin on that. Your ideas. Well, this is the way I was raised. That you know, both of my parents. My father was in the military, and he grew up on a farm in Texas. So that was during the depression. Uh, share property, his father was a share. Oh, yeah. My mother was from a small town in Texas. They're both small towns in Texas. They're, they're about eight miles apart. But um, because of World War II, because my father was uh, drafted, and uh, he had to participate. But he said, in relation to education, he said he didn't know how bereft his education really was until he got around the men in the North, whether they were black or they were white. And he said, in Texas, they didn't teach us anything. They hardly taught us anything. And he was just amazed at how much the guys in the North knew. Wow. And he's, so he grew up, so he understood then. He understood that a lot, uh, he said, it's not that they know everything. He said, because they don't, because if they had the same, just the, they just, their education was just a little bit better than ours. Got it, yeah. But basically, if you compared what he learned with the people in the North, 
and the experiences that he got from being around different pe people. And he was happy for that. And my mother's the kind of person that she said, you treat people the way you want to be. Yeah, treated. yeah, there you go. And it doesn't matter. Um, he said, she said, just don't let them run over you. Don't let them fight you when you turn the, the cheek and not try to fight them back. Yeah, right. So you've That's got to nature. protect yourself. That's not nature. That's you, right. You have to protect yourself. But basically, when you deal with people, you really want to treat them the way you want to be treated. And that's the way my parents treated people. My father didn't have, my father, he referred to young people. For instance, if it was a little boy, he called them young man. Whether yeah. it was they were black, didn't matter what color they were. He saw the little girl, he called them young lady. And that's so I that's grew up with the idea that you just have to treat people in accordance to the way you want to be treated. And because he did that thing with the girl, he never, my father was very respectful of women. And he, uh, and often I think of him when, you know, the word girl has become, or can be a pejorative. Yeah, for sure. Okay. And we don't realize how much of a pejorative this is, and we don't realize how women are not valued. And I remember well, maybe about a week ago, my one of my granddaughters was looking at the television, and there was a group of people. One was a man, and the rest were women. And she called them girls. She called him a man. Mm. I said, oh, my, you know, this is something that I want to work on, something in society I want to raise the thinking of what a girl is. So I came up with this idea that a girl is really an acronym. I Come made on. it an acronym. Come on. Idea. Bring that saying. Gen genius yeah. in real life. All right. So I did have goddess, but then I changed my mind about that because I remember you were saying that anything that ended in ESS meant less than. Yes. So I changed it because people would misunderstand what that meant. So I didn't want to get into all of that. But when you think about a girl, that's what I believe we could think about is to raise the intellect so that you understand that a girl is just a goddess in real life. Mm. I mean, is a is a genius in real life. Yes. We often especially in the South where women, black women, especially black women were called girls. It's, we have to have been geniuses for the stuff that they had to give us to Come eat. They have Come some on. kind of genius to make that stuff edible. <laughs> yes, indeed. That was, but then a lot of yeah. women are like that. A women across the world are like that. Yes. We're given something very little and then we can make something great up. yeah and then my mom was like that yeah i use the word genius because in this book the n word i think i saw where the g the capital g meant mm -hmm. expansive mm -hmm. and the word goddess was just too little mm -hmm. to define mm -hmm. what a girl really was what a yeah. girl is wow that's wonderful. Yeah, G uh, has to also do with growth. G has to do with things that generate. And genius is generated. It's cultivated. It's not necessarily that the physical, biological infant is born genius. But because every human being has what are called genes, when genes are cultivated, actively consciously by the parents, by people in the environment, then the ultimate result of that is genius. And it has nothing to do with schooling. It has to do with environment. There's a, a hadith of Muhammad the prophet that they attribute to him that says that every child is born upon the fitrah. 
That's the gene. And that's the latent genius. Every human being is born as a latent genius with genius dormant within their genes, waiting to express itself. What allows it to express itself, this is me talking, not the prophet now. What allows it to express itself is the uh, putting of that person's life into a, the circumstances that will uh, that will uh, um, um, bring out that genius. So what we're seeing in the world today as successful people and non-successful people is a result of the environment, the circumstances in their environment, which continues that particular saying of the prophet. He said that every child is born upon the fitrah. However, it is his environment, beginning with his parents, that causes him to be something, my words, other than fitrah-based. The fitrah is cohesive. It's responsible for the human life maintaining its integrity, its wholeness. So the saying of the prophet in that case, I don't know if he actually said it, I wouldn't dare, but it's a beautiful uh, hadith according to, uh, as far as I'm concerned. And what he is saying in saying that those who are born upon the fitrah are born whole, and then he made the comparison to animals who have some defect. See? So what he's saying is that when there's a defect in your fitrah, that's going to cause you to be something other than what the fitrah intended for you to be. So how many humans can we think about or know about who have verged off of the central focus of what the fitrah was intended to assist them with? And uh, fitrah is a word from the Arabic verb fatara. And uh, it's where we get the English word pattern, you've heard me say that, I'm sure, with the P interchanging yeah. with the F and then the TR in fitra and then the TR in pattern. Uh, the N is a suffix in pattern. If you put an H on the end of fitra, that's a suffix also. So it's not a part of the main three-letter root. Um, so the fitra represents natural patterns in nature that we're supposed to learn from. When we concentrate on those patterns, the information that Allah sends us through the study of those patterns is what brings out of us that express the genius that you're discussing now. See, one brother tried to tell me in a um, one of my comments uh, sections of a video I did when I was speaking on the fitra, he said, you're wrong. You don't know what the fitra is. He said, the fitra is from fatra, which means uh, something that, you know, comes up out of something else, like a plant, you know, like a plant comes up out of the ground um, when it um, comes above surface and it opens up, that's fitra. I said, well, we're saying exactly the same thing. I'm just talking about your your inherent genius. <laughs> that's what's coming up out of the ground of your soul and expressing itself for other people to benefit from like you benefit from those plants. So we have to stop uh, allowing the so-called scholarship of the world to give us the true meaning for what the Quran has been expressing to us. You know, it was the Quran, in my opinion, that assisted the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in arriving at his latter day conclusions, because the latter day Elijah Muhammad was not the initial Elijah Muhammad, who was before that Elijah Pool. The early day Elijah Muhammad was in learning mode as all new babies are, new toddlers, infants, teenagers even. And when they reach the age of fullness that we call adulthood, that's when they begin to have to do things independently, even of their parents. And I believe that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad came to a recognition about his own role. And, you know, I always say to people that if you are a true follower of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, then you should respect his last will and testament. His last will and testament are in the last things that he told his people. And that, as a conclusion, is in the 1974 Savior's Day. Se uh, yeah, mm -hmm. February 25th, I believe it was, 1974, a year before he passed. And he said some things there that were kind of hard for some people to hear maybe or, or accept because it was different than what he had been saying for the previous 40 or so years. 
he was already into his 43rd year when he said these things. And he, speaking of your attention, this is what he told us about our attention. He said, stop, stop uh, concentrating so much on the white man. He said, he's not your problem. He said, you are your problem. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. So he said, start focusing on yourself because you become over infatuated with this material life. You become over infatuated with these fur coats and these diamond rings and all of these other things that he used to complain about, even amongst his own children. Why are you looking so flamboyant? That's not, that's not what we're here for. You're here for this internal growth, to grow you into a people who are qualified for not only local leadership, but for world leadership. So this was the this was the Elijah Muhammad that I that I became attracted to in night when I heard him say that I became thoroughly attracted to his message although I never was in the nation of Islam my older brother was but I never was in the nation of Islam I didn't take Islam seriously until W D Muhammad mm -hmm. came in 75 and and I didn't join his organization until believe it or not till 1983 officially <laughs> as far as Shahada goes. But I, I was there just about every week. I was still getting the newspapers. I was getting the Muhammad Speaks. I was getting the Bilalian News, you know. I, all of that stuff was coming to me, and I was assimilating all of that information. But my respect, as I said, for those people, and I know they have a lot of criticism about, about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, but I don't think they know him the way those of us who were close to him and close to his teachings know him. Absolutely impossible for them to have known him like that. They like to say some very disparaging things about him, his personal life, you know, that kind of thing. But again, we are mortals among mortals and we're going to make mistakes. But when he turned the center of concentration towards ourselves and said that we are the problem, and spoke directly to the feminine principal ones in the audience, the, the women. And he said, you look very pretty in those white dresses. He said, I hope you're as clean underneath those dresses as you are on the surface of those dresses. So he was, he was moving very, very gingerly, very, very scientifically. He was moving the attention of the people who loved him and whom he loved in the direction of safety. He was a, he was a good shepherd in that regard. And he didn't want to see his people fumble and fail after all of his years of work that he had put in 44 straight years before he died. That's a lot of work in the middle of what was going on in America and all of the changes. And he spoke to those changes also. He began to show appreciation for the world of so-called white uh, uh, um, advancement of things. Even in race relations, he said, if the white man can respect you, he said, you should respect him. He said, in fact, respect everybody. I'm quoting him now. This I mean from my heart. Don't think that you're so great now that God has promised you the kingdom. He said, wait until you get in. Now, I want all of the followers of Elijah Muhammad to think about that. That's a powerful statement. What he's saying is that even after 44 years of Mr. Elijah Muhammad's teachings, he told you you were still not in in the garden. You were still, you were still not in the kingdom. All of that was preparation work. The kingdom is related to the coming into proper understanding of the Quran. That's why I am so pleased that I have been gifted with this system of nunetics because it it shortcuts your development and urges you very quickly towards the stature that you need to be living on. And at the same time, it disallows any people, the Arabs, any people from being your masters ever again. You know, that's something. I, may I say two You things? can say anything you want. <laughs> this is your time. I came into the nation. The idea of me coming into the nation of Islam was planted in my mind in 1959 when I saw that program called The Hate That the Hate, hate That Hate Produced. And you know what I saw? Mm -hmm. I saw, I have never seen so many black women in one place and they were in white and Beautiful. they were bringing, they were walking into the arena and they were taking their places in the bleachers. They were so neat and oh, they were picture. so beautiful yeah. and all their, and I said, something said, 
this is what you're going to do. But I was eight. That was 1959. Mm -hmm. And it didn't happen. The year, the year I was born, actually. Really? <laughs> yeah. In fact, that program aired on the day that I was born, I believe, July 16th, 1959. I if I remember correctly. Yeah. Okay. That's uh -huh. so, so I was watching that program. And uh, as I grew, then I began to understand what it was that I was watching. And I wanted to go and come into the nation. And I knew that, of course, my parents wouldn't let me do that. So I knew that I had to have my own, I had to have my own money, I had to have my own car, and I got all of that. Mm -hmm. I went to the place where I had met some Muslims before 1975, and, and my mother would drop me off at this place. No, I would get off the bus and wait for my mother to come pick me up because there was no bus to where we lived in San Antonio mm -hmm. at that time. And there were sisters there that they were always talking to me about the nation. This was in the, must be 1970, 71. So, cause I was in nursing school and she, she was talking about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and how he wanted to have a hospital for us. And so she said, oh, well, you should, when you become a nurse, you should come to work for us and work in our hospital. And you know what I thought? Mm. I was just thinking of this, I said, yeah, right. But anyway, mm -hmm. anyway, when I finally graduated, I went back to the place and it was shut down. This was in 73. Mm -hmm. It was shut down and I felt something. I had an intuition. I said, this, I don't know what's going on. And then maybe 18 months later or so, uh, things changed. Then finally, in the 19... 90s i finally got my ex in 1999 but anyway i'm always in the state of learning and i remember the most honorable i mean i remember uh minister farrakhan honorable minister farrakhan saying something this about wallace and he said that he was a brilliant person and he had a certain job to do and so when i heard you i said hmm he was a follower of Wallace. I wonder what's going on. So I said, the minister said that Wallace was brilliant. Let me go see how brilliant he, this guy, allowed you. Let me see how really <laughs> brilliant he is. And so I continued to watch. And I heard this word. This is the first time I heard this word fitra before. Mm -hmm. I remember you saying it. And you're I just don't want to keep referring her to her what um, instructor Karima Bilal saying it too. Fitra, fitra. So the way I understand this word fitra, when I was a girl, and I believe probably when your wife was a girl, we heard these, this information from our old elders that said, don't ever chase a man. You are the prize. Go ahead. So what's the fitra? The ovum doesn't chase the sperm. Oh, buddy. Sperm goes to the ovum. And I know they wouldn't have known that in those days. Right. They didn't have that technology. That's right. They didn't have that technology, or at least they didn't know it. Right. So I said, <clears throat> oh, that's what he's talking about. We have to live our lives according to the fitra. So when our mothers and our elder were telling, our mothers and our grandmothers were telling us, don't chase a man, you're the prize. And there it is. The ovum is the prize for the, for the sperm. That's right. That's right. So I said, hey, he's on to something. I said, yeah. this, he's on to something. So yeah. that's why I decided just said, let me just... Whatever is going, I, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna take this, this, this course. Well, I'm happy that you did. You know, as I've said on many occasions, we live in a uh, an electromagnetic universe. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they even gave that to us in the wrong order. It should be a magnetic electro universe, not an electromagnetic universe, because electricity is the masculine principle. Just like the sperm, electricity goes out in search of a socket or, you know, a lamp or whatever it's going to go out in search of, right? But um, magnetism is feminine. 
it attracts. Just like the ovum, the ovum is attracting the exact sperm that is exactly compatible with her chemistry. Oh boy, when we start teaching our children like this, the girls, quote unquote, will have much more respect for themselves. In that old wives tale that you just mentioned, don't chase the boys. You be still and just reflect the excellence of the nature and the qualities that you have and the exact right compliment will be magnetized towards you, just like the exact compliment for that ovum's chemistry is being magnetized towards her. Although there are thousands upon thousands of spermatozoa, only one gets the prize on the most part, maybe two, yeah, twin or whatever, yeah. But basically only one sperm gets that prize. All of the rest of them become sidelined. Like the football player who's running to make the touchdown, it's just one guy that's going to make that touchdown. But look at how many people he has sidelining him that are actually his protectors until he actually makes the touchdown. So nature is teaching us these very valuable lessons. And the feminine principle that is typified, should be at least, in every female she should understand herself as the most magnetic force in the universe. She can attract anything she puts her mind and attention to. She can attract wealth. Look at what, um, during the days even of Jim Crow, uh, Madam C.J. Walker became a millionaire. They like to say millionaires, but you know what I think about that ESS stuff, right? She became a millionaire in Jim Crow days from selling black hair products, black hair care products. How did she do that with all of the racism and stuff they talk about and all of the, you know, white supremacy and all that? Who allowed this woman to become a millionaire and hold on to her million? She didn't lose it until she handed her business off to her daughter or something like that. Then, you know, same thing with the Tropicana Orange Juice Company. That man owned that until he died, and then it was sold off to other folks. See? I didn't know that. Yes, indeed. Right? So there is this uh, idea that there are these people out there who won't let us achieve. They won't let us accomplish. They, 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 the only reason we're not doing that is because we're so focused on the idea of not being able to do it. And that magnetic brain is magnetizing that lack of success in our direction. It's just magnetizing it. It's sticking in the emotional part of the brain. The emotional part, the limbic brain is magnetic. The neocortex is electric. It sends out thoughts, sends out ideas. But what's coming in is like the ovum for the, for the limbic brain. The limbic brain is the storehouse. It stores the emotions and the memories of things that it's coming in contact with, just like the ovum is storing the chemical composition of that sperm. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Yes, I know you're loving that. I see it in your face. You're loving this, ain't you? Yeah. <laughs> I love having fun with people who are smart. <laughs> Thank you. So, so the credit so the, goes to a lot. <laughs> yes, indeed. Alhamdulillah. Right. But the um, the 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 message here is that once we learn the difference between the magnetism and the electricity and how they operate in the fitra that we've been discussing, that's when we're going to begin to have conscious success. That's when we're going to be able to think a thing and have it materialize. And I'm, I'm sure based on my independent studies of Mr. W.D. Farad, also known as Master Farad Muhammad, mm -hmm. I've studied him thoroughly. I, I'm sure that I've studied him more than most people in the nation of Islam past or present nation of Islam. I just haven't had that conversation with anybody, but I'm willing to. I believe I know things about Mr. W.D. Farad that would rock the world of people who love and appreciate him because the surface image that was presented of him was being 
partially digested by people who had no references for who he was, where he was from, what he was talking about, and where we where he was going. They they were not um, they were not uh, psychologically prepared for the weight of his message. And that's my belief. Anybody can disagree with that if they want. His ministers, the other people under his, under his leadership, were not ready for the magnitude. And I know they're still not ready because I still listen to them. I still listen to Savior's Day. And I, I, I listen to the ministers who open up. I listen to his son. And I know brilliant people. Now, don't get me wrong. Brilliant people, and I love them. But I, I also know. I, you think they're ready? You think they're? I'm, I'm not sure, but I'm telling you what. Okay. I'm, telling, I'm gonna tell you this. I know that there are enough people to continue to listen, and they want to raise their elevation of uh, spiritualism and mentality. Yes. And whatever they need to know. Yes. And I said. And sometimes, sometimes I said, mm, I don't know if I should to listen to him because some things sound disparaging. But I said, I'm going to do it because I want to know what it is that he knows. I want to know. I want to know. And I remember you said something about the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And I remember hearing, I remember the minister said that the messenger that the most honorable Elijah Muhammad told him that if you stop thinking of the so-called white man in that way, it'll be, you wouldn't even have to know he's around only if you had something tied around your finger tight enough that you would recognize that he was here. And he stopped him That's from beautiful. calling and he stopped the minister from calling them the devil. And so, um, I am at the point now where I want to find as much information from where I can get it. Yeah. Whether it's about That's intelligent. Yeah. So, and so, and I also remember hearing some brothers say that whenever the messenger had to go speak to someone, or I don't know if it was, I've never known him to debate anybody, but that's the way they said it. Mm -hmm. But he said he always took his holy Quran and he was never wrong. So I said, well, he has the respect that the holy Quran, he has always told us about that. And about mm -hmm. the numbers of books that Master Farad Muhammad had him read was about the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon yes, him. Yes, that's in message to the black men of America, yeah. To read 104 books. Mm -hmm. He sent them to the Library of Congress and to some <laughs> other yes. places. Yeah, yeah. So... Actually, I'm in the right place. I'm in the. Allah sent you here. You 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 said you were thinking earlier about how you got here. Allah sent you yeah. here. Yeah. yeah that's, there's, there's no no confusion I, about that. Not in my mind. You know, there is so much information out there from all different kinds of people. Why would I not accept information from my own brother? Great question. I don't care what you know his religion, uh, or no your lifestyle. It sounds like you sound like a very upright and moral man. Why would I not take information from him? There's so much on the outside in the world. Yeah. And where, for instance, if you know about, I read something about, and I saw something on a documentary about Einstein. And generally, we think about Einstein, we think about physics and so forth. But there were some things about his personality that, and the way he lived his life, what could be very embarrassing. And people don't ever yeah. talk about. It. Same thing with Sigmund the Fraud. <laughs> <laughs> there was just so many things that you would wonder. Well, why would I be listening to just as you said last night? I believe. Yes. You were saying, well, why would I listen to him if this man was a smoker, and he died because of the smoke? And why? <laughs> how can I listen to him? Cancer of the and esophagus. Like, yeah. Okay. But he's going to teach you discipline? I don't he's think not. so. And see, I people get what... away with that. I'm going to tell you why people get away with that and become famous behind it. Because mm -hmm. <clears throat> they don't really believe in their own theories. They're really stealing somebody else's idea mm -hmm. and presenting themselves as 
the ones who invented it. Sigmund Freud got most of what he got from the study of psychology out of ancient Egypt. He erased the tracks to that. All of that libido, ego, super ego, it, he got all of that by just rearranging the figures and the words and the meanings for words. And he took it out of ancient commission understanding and put it into English terms that he began to invent. He's the one who actually invented the term consciousness mm -hmm. that we use all of the time now. We don't know to trace it back to him, but he's the one. But where did he get the concept mm -hmm. of conscious, doing something with choice? This came from the ancient comedic people, the Egypt, so-called Egyptian people. But again, he just erased his tracks. Like many Europeans have done, they've gone into even the Muslim lands or had the Muslims come into their lands and the Muslims taught them all of these sciences and all of these different areas. But many of these Europeans decided to erase the tracks to their Muslim learning and they represented these things through Greek terms, you see? But it's been fortunate that Nunetics has been able to sift through the rubble of what they presented and find the consonantal connections. That's Allah's work. Only Allah could preserve the integrity of these languages in the way that he's done so that it makes it very easy for Joe and Jane, me and you, to be able to still see behind the veil of what they were trying to establish. And we know that all of the credit goes to Allah and not to them. Not, that's why I don't have a problem condemning or criticizing their scholarship. Mm -hmm. I don't have a problem condemning or criticizing the scholarship uh, amongst our people. But I don't outwardly just poo-poo their work mm -hmm. because I didn't create them. I didn't create the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I didn't create Minister Louis Farrakhan. I didn't, I didn't create, uh, you know, uh, Khalid Muhammad, you know, people who I've had serious disagreements with have met and have serious disagreements with. But when I meet him, he's still my brother. I still mm -hmm. hug him. There's a video online now with me and Minister Louis Farrakhan. And I spoke right before him and he hugged me and shed tears while we were hugging. And he said, please stay in touch with me. And it wasn't no regular stay in touch with me. Mm -hmm. He was very, very touched by what I had to say about him and Wallace Muhammad, Wallace D. Muhammad. It's on YouTube. Just Google Ben Bilal, Imam Ben Bilal and Minister Louis Farrakhan, if you haven't seen it. Right. Okay, so, yeah. Yeah. So I don't, I don't have this problem that other Muslims, Sunnis and Orthodox Muslims have with Minister Louis Farrakhan. He's from our experience. Yes. So if anybody's going to critique him, it should be those of us who are knowledgeable enough to critique him because we know him from way back when, before he was Minister Louis Farrakhan. He was, he, he was, uh, you know, under Malcolm at the time. So we know about his growth and development. We know the things in his environment that influenced him to do and say the things that he didn't say, didn't said. That man saved a lot of lives. In 1972, I believe it was, in Harlem, at what is now Masjid Malcolm Shabazz, used to be Temple Number Seven in Harlem, so when when, they, uh, when the police broke into the into the mosque, right? And if he didn't get out there with that bullhorn and stand on top of that car and tell those people we ain't gonna have this violent thing and be killing up each other and killing up police and all that, everybody just maintain your cool. You understand? That was his January 6th moment. <laughs> he said, no, we're not going to do it like this. Police had came into the mosque and melee ensued. Children from the University of Islam was in, were in class and they're coming in there with their guns drawn. Now that was a no-no. Even as far as the law was concerned, you're not supposed to do that in a religious establishment. The sergeant was there, but no superior officer to the sergeant was even there. So you can't just say we got a call like they do today. Well, we got a call. Somebody's in here with a pistol or somebody's in here with a rifle or whatever. No, they can say anything. And they do say anything just to get into the edifice. But that wasn't right. But fortunately, Minister Farrakhan was in his office that day. 1972, I believe, is the correct year. Correct me if I'm wrong in the chat box. Right? Mm -hmm. So... Harlem was about to be set on fire that day because the, na the natives, the neighborhood people were coming with bats and sticks and wanting to turn over. I think one police car was turned over. 
they were ready to go to blow. Man, the Nation of Islam had such respect in Harlem, especially, and amongst these other cities, L.A., Texas. Even. I mean, they, they were just top of the line people who were able to magnetize respect because of their protocol. I remember as a 12-year-old, 13-year-old going up, especially when I became 16, yeah, about, about 1974 or so, I remember going up to, to Malcolm. I, re, I was there listening to Minister Farrakhan for at least three years before Imam Muhammad came in. I used to make it my business if I if I didn't go there in person to Temple Number no. 7 on 116th Street and what was called Lenox Avenue at the time, it was coming across live on WVLS radio. So me, my mother, my uncle, my brother, my older brother, all of us would sit around that radio. We wouldn't miss 1 p.m. on Sunday because Minister Farrakhan was speaking. And I'm telling you, he was such a sobering force for Harlem and for all of the other people who were able to, to hear his message. So people can't tell me. I know, I know there was conflict and all of that. When Imam Muhammad came in, there was conflict. Imam Muhammad gave him certain edicts to follow and he kind of half followed them. Then he became despondent, but he didn't hold it to himself. He, he voiced it like a man would do. He voiced it to Imam Muhammad. He said, I'm having a conflict here because I believe that you're diminishing the uh, importance of your father. This is what he told Wallace. He said, I, you're, you're, you're diminishing the importance of your father as a leader for our people. He's a necessary importance for us. And you're teaching other things and you're going other places. He said, I can't go with you now. Maybe I'll catch up with you later, but I can't go with you now because too many of our people still need this saving that he saw himself as being in a position to do. So the people who criticize him from overseas, the mullahs and the sheikhs and the shakers and those people, they don't know that history. You don't know the ingredients that went into the making of this man's personality. And you don't know what Allah may have saved us from through him. We think we're looking for pristine, pure people to, to, to be leaders. You know, you got to be some royal dude with a long, you know, black beard or gray beard and a kufi and, a, you know, a big old thing on your head. And I'm talking about the men now. They're wearing the khimars on it. And we think you have to come like that with a long flowing thawl, but something like that. And you have to always be dhikr, in dhikr mode. If people are talking to you, used to subhanAllah, subhanAllah. We think that's the kind of leader that Muslims are looking for now. And they've been bamboozled into that psychology. So for our situation, and we have a unique situation as a people, this is what a lot of folks around the world don't understand. The African-American so-called, this black man so-called, was the only people that I have been able to um, discover in history, <laughs> talking about the fitra, we're the only people who were, who were born, you know, all babies are born inside, right, mm -hmm. from their mama's belly. We're the only mm -hmm. people who were born outside. We were born in the fields. Oh. That was mm -hmm. the beginning of our birth as a unique soul in America. This group soul I'm talking about. So the mechanism for what we see as survival, it changed when that happened. We were born as free for all. Most babies are born and they are immediately protected by the mother, at least, if not the mother and the father and the family circle. We didn't have that protection when we were born in the, the, the plantation fields of all of these different states around the United States. We didn't have that protection. We were born wide open in the sunlight, no protection from the sunlight. The mother would give birth and she was immediately sent back out into the field. How many of you people out there in La La Muslim land understand what that's about? and the effect that would have on the psyche and the genes of those people. So if you don't know what's affecting the genetic makeup, you are not in a position to criticize our people. Let us be the ones to criticize ourselves in closed circles. Mm -hmm. So my public statement is that I have no issues with Minister Louis Farrakhan. That's my brother. He's yes. getting older and he's getting wiser. We don't know how much longer he'll be with us. But again, I could be the one to die tomorrow, right? So I can't even put that into the equation. He's a brilliant mind. He's a studious person. He's always been dedicated to study. That's what people loved him for because they knew when they came to that temple meeting that next week, they were going to learn something new that they did not know prior to that. 
So he himself, although he might not consider himself to be, I do, I consider him to be a master teacher. Oh, absolutely. And you know, sir, when you were talking about Imam Wardin Muhammad, may Allah be pleased with him. I heard you say something about the information that he tried to give the, the people. And what it sounds like to me is that it was just too brilliant for the people to understand, too much light for the people to look at and understand. So he, so, and when I thought about, I said, hmm, this is why I'm following, this is why I'm, I'm taking these classes with instructor Benjamin Bilal, is because maybe I can get some of that genius. Maybe I can get some of that. Brilliance. Yeah, genes are transferable. <laughs> May I say something? <laughs> Please do. You were talking about Kemet, ancient Egypt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, something that uh, you were talking, and you also had a guest, a young man who was from the Wolof pe people. And I yeah, believe yeah. You talk about how that language is really very if it's not a Semitic language, it should be. Yes. Because I have read that Wolof is, if not, the, the language of ancient Egypt or Kemet, that is pretty well close to it. Mm -hmm. And I remember you saying that, and I remember reading that in Wolof, I remember hearing that too, that when you add a T, and in ancient Egypt, when you add the T to the end of a word, it made it feminine. You were yes. talking about a woman. Yes. Or or the feminine pr principle. Yes. And there is a word, hepcat. Yeah. Or hepi cat. That's back in the 50s, 60s. You remember sure. when the brothers used to call, first in the, back in the 30s, they would call them hepcat. Yeah. Okay. Then the word became hep and then cat. Yeah. It became an adjective in the form of hep or hip. Yeah. And then it became cat. Yeah. But we know it doesn't have anything to do with a K A C A T, but probably a K H T. Go oh, ahead. Yeah. So, so if the K, if the T, if the brothers called each other cat, okay, so that ends in T. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that make that feminine? Yes. And I kind of wanted to know, and I read this book called, well, I have this book called From Juba to Jive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in the book, it says that um, that was a Wolof word. In another book called the Deep begin. It's, it's not. It's called the the deep begin. It has something to do with the deep beginnings by Dr. Charles French the uh Third. -huh. It's called the. Um, I don't know. It's called. Oh, there, it's called the Star of Deep Beginnings. Say it again. Towards the the camera. Okay. It's called. Well, you can't. It's called the Star of Deep Beginnings. Deep Beginnings, okay. The Star of Deep Beginnings. And who is the author? By Dr. Charles S. Finch III. Got it. He's an MD. And he writes about history. And in this book, there is a picture of a woman. At, and I think at this particular time, all these people were coming to one of the Carolinas. And she had come from Senegal. And she was a healer. She was over a hundred years old. She was called an indep cat. Mm. So I'm thinking that meant she was a female healer, in depth mm. cat. Mm. So I'm kind of want to know why, if that's a wall of work, and if hep cat comes from a wall of work, why is the T 
why is the brother calling each other a cat? Why does yeah. the brother use that? Yeah, instead of the female being. Yeah. Why, yeah. why is it the brother? Yeah, well, you know, that's an interesting question and my brain is going into overtime okay. in my effort to give you an answer to that. Okay. And yes, the cat is a, uh, they call it feline, whether it's a male or female. Yeah. The cat is still a feline. Uh, the young cat is called a pussy cat. <laughs> Another reference to uh, the female. Mm -hmm. So these are people who have developed um, hmm, what's the proper word here? Um, conceptual understanding of words. They don't understand words in the same way that we've been taught to understand words in the common public of masses of people. These people who are masters of language, they understand the hidden importance of masculine, feminine ideas in language. Even Mr. W.D. Farad understood it. It's in his lessons that he actually referred to God as she. Are you familiar with that? No. Yeah. First time I've ever heard. I, I, I'll find it for you and I'll send it to you. I know that. And I'm, let me just put a, a tail end on okay, that. Okay. It's not because he was referring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as she. Oh, okay. Allah is neither he nor she, neither masculine nor feminine as a power. But he was referring to the God that he was establishing, which again, he called. This is not me. This is not W.D. Muhammad saying this. This is Mr. W.D. Farad in his own lessons to the nation of Islam. He said that God is merely power and force. That's how he put it, that simply. He said, God is just power and force. And power. I've, I've heard yeah. that. No, not force and power. Power oh. and force, because power is a feminine product. Force is a masculine product. And I'm sure people listening to us right now say, oh, I understand that perfectly. <laughs> yeah, men like to force themselves on people. Women have a sway, their power is in their ability to sway and convince and cajole, see? So he said, and he was really just referring again to what we call magnetism and, and uh, electricity, power and force, all right? Now, um, I believe that these Hence, and clues in Mr. Farrar's lessons were born out of an effort on his part to bring the people who were his audience up multitudes of levels above where so-called white society had left us. Like you said, there are people who are teachers of people and they they help to advance the intellect of people and there are people who won't tell you nothing like the people there in texas and your mother's generation they tell you nothing which what you knew when you got there you might have known less after you leave those people because <laughs> they take away stuff you thought you knew and because they're trying to condition your mind to support their scheme so mr farad's intention if i can speak that authoritatively on that was to advance us incrementally, incrementally, in increments, in spurts. And those spurts would manifest itself in about, in like periods of 10 years, 10 years, 10, like every 10 years, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad would introduce something that was like, wow. Are we really going to visit that idea now? He didn't stay where he was in 1932, 1933, 1934, or during those seven years when he was running away from the governmental authorities. And No, that was his gestation period. That was him getting the stuff that he needed for his further growth and advancement. In uh, 1959, again, the year that I was born, he, he made uh, Umrah, the smaller Hajj, to Mecca. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. I've, I've heard that he went there 
Yeah, he went there and he said he cried like a baby because of the power that he felt, that surge that he felt when he was in the precincts of the Kaaba and all of what was necessary. There was an older, taller gentleman who was accompanying him as his kind of sponsor, and he was leading him through all of the rites. Now, people should know that um, Umrah doesn't include all of the rituals and rites that a haji would experience. So he never made haj proper, but he made... When I say proper, I mean, specifically, it wasn't to be considered Hajj because too many things were left off. There was no Mount Arafat. You know, there was a lot of things, you know, that a Haji would experience that an Umrah person would not. Let's just say the Umrah is like reading the table of contents to a book. Yeah. But mm -hmm. the Hajj is reading the entire book, if mm -hmm. we can make that comparison. But mm -hmm. he was so impressed now remember this is 1959 he got started in 1933 1934 34 specifically so a couple of decades went by two almost three decades went by when he came back from umrah guess what he did he took the focus off of religion per se and his focus became economic development oh, yes. and I'm going to give you one of the reasons why if I may Go right ahead. he might... was told at that time most people were told that Mecca was a land flowing with milk and honey and that the streets were made of gold in fact that was actually a part of Mr. Farad's teachings so Elijah Muhammad, when he went, he was looking for what his teacher told him was there. Land flowing with milk and honey and streets paved with gold. And when he went there, he started looking for it and he realized it wasn't there. And therefore, not that his teacher was lying, but it must have a higher meaning. That's how that went. If it wasn't there literally, physically, he must have been speaking figuratively. So Elijah Muhammad took that as a hint to start doing his own sense of economic improvement, economic development. And that's where his economic effort was born. It was born upon the return of Elijah Muhammad to the United States in 1960. He left in uh, December of 1959. He visited in 1959. I think he returned sometime in January of 1960. And you know all of the madness that was going on in the country around that time also with the mm -hmm. Jim Crow, with all of these other issues we were dealing with. But he was there being fortified in terms of what he was learning, what was impacting his nervous system. He was there being fortified, fortified, fortified. So that by the time he came back, looking at the squalor and the poverty in the Black communities everywhere he would go, he knew that the answer was to stop concentrating so much on the spiritual, you know, type of religious kind of experience like the Christians were going through with their Bible up under their arm and the Jesus, Jesus, Jesus thing. He took us away from that beginning in the in 1960. And he began to impress upon us the serious need to develop ourselves as a materially oriented, not oriented, but materially based community. That's when he, that's when he invented the be, do your do for self philosophy. And don't depend on these other people, but they'll tell you anything. But do for self. That's when that hospital idea was born. Then how are we going to trust people who we can't trust <laughs> with our life? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yes. we were being born in hospitals. They're taking us out of the womb with metal clamps, causing all kinds of problems, injury, uh, causing children to become uh, retarded and, and have a serious uh, neuro neurological and, and brain issues because of the way they treated us at birth. Sometimes they would just kill us at birth. That was all a part of the psychology that was built into Mr. Farad's uh, uh, explanation of, of how so-called white people were created. He talked about the nurses. Huh? Yeah, he said that in that process of grafting, that there was a, 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 a period where when a baby was born, if it were born dark skinned, which is how all of the people started out in, in this explanation, in his narrative, 
But if they were born dark skin, then the nurses would kill the baby. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they would stick needles. Listen to what I'm talking about here. You, 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 you jab pushers. He would stick needles into the brains of the newborn babies. And then he would tell the parents that they were angel children. They died to become angel children. But as the process continued, this process of so-called grafting from the black gene into the brown gene, which created all of these five so-called races that we identify now, he said that there had to be a separation of the genes. Now, in science, in medicine, there's no such thing as a black gene or a brown gene. So how could he have been talking about something literal? That's why I say the man was a master. He was a master of language. Mr. Farad was a master of language. So this separation of uh, brown and black was speaking to a psychological and a spiritual event that was that Mr. Farad himself was employing as the modern day uh, Yakub. Now, I know a lot of people don't want to hear that, who love and follow him, but I'm telling you, we're judging with our emotional minds when we're looking at this information, when we should be trying to judge more accurately what's being said with our rational and scientific mind, because he was simply telling us what he was doing, separating the black from the brown or from the brown from the black. You have to first know what black means in that kind of esoteric language. And black doesn't mean skin color. That's not what they were dealing with. Black means those people who were being ruled by nature. Nature in that mytho mythological language is called black. Not because it's bad. It's great. Every infant is born into the world with a black mind, a, meaning a blank. Black and blank are the same word. You can look that up in the dictionary and it'll tell you that. I've seen that. Yeah, right? So, so every child is born as a black man. Because man means mind. And I know, I'm sure Mr. Farad knew that, that man means mind everywhere you go. Male might mean something different as biology, but man means mind. So to separate the, the, the brown out of the black, to create these subsequent colors, simply means that out of nature, out of the blackness of nature, is an effort to study nature. And when you engage yourself in very serious, studious study, that's what this symbolism refers to as brown. Right now, in some dictionaries, you can still find it. If the dictionary is old enough, look up the phrase brown study. It means a very intensive study of a subject, not cursory. Not mm -hmm. the way we do just trying to, you know, get our degree and, you know, we'll never remember this stuff after this. We're just studying for the test and we'll forget it the next day. Mm -hmm. That's not a brown study. Mm -hmm. See how they say, how now, brown cow? You've heard that expression? Well, what is the cow? The cow is the animal that chews the cud. The cow is the animal that regurgitates its food. It has more than one stomach and has two stomachs. And it regurgitates its food for, for continued and repeated processing in the mouth, right? So the cow is chewing. You always see the cow chewing, chewing the cud. Every time it eats, it's chewing the cud, chewing the cud. That's the intellect of doing that, chewing the information over and over again, even after it's gone down like I do with neonetics. Yeah, I thought I knew what that letter meant. I'm going to go back because I think there's something. I know you do the same thing. There's something else there. Let's see that in Dr. Bilal video again. That's, yeah. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Yo, may, I yeah, yeah. may I excuse myself for a moment? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. For sure. No problem. I have to say this because it's funny to me. But when you reached back to get that book a little while ago, mm -hmm. you have such a perfect AI image behind you. Like normally I'd see like, uh, you know, distortions in your contour and all of that. And, it's a, and as soon as I looked at it, when we started, I said, wow, what a fabulous uh, place she lives in. 
<laughs> I said, when you reached back to get the book and the book appeared out of out of nowhere, yeah. <laughs> I said, maybe this is the mother plane she's on. <laughs> Where is she broadcasting from? <laughs> But uh, whatever you're doing with that program there, you need to send that to Instructor Milan. I need a few extra backgrounds to work with myself. So that's wonderful. That, that's that's a Star Trek back, background. Ah, okay. That that's answers a, that question. They're, they're going to be. Trek. Yeah, they're going to be that specific. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that detailed. But anyway, pick up from where you were. So I'd like for you, okay, you were talking about the needle in the brain. Yeah. And that's what they do to our children in some of these schools. You want to learn as a child. And, and I think I heard it from, you know, as Malcolm, when he said when he was in school, I think he was in the, he said yeah. he wanted to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Stevie Wonder, the same thing happened when he was a child. And I'm going to have to tell you something about the, else about that too. Just remind me, please. Mm -hmm. and the minister said the same thing. But that's what they do. They're, they put the needle in the brain. Yeah. They put the needle in the brain. That's what our children are suffering from, the needle in the brain. And we, we just need to bring yeah. our children out of that. Well, you know what it means to needle somebody. It means to constantly agitate them, right? But yeah. that okay. story, I believe, is connected to something much more profound than even what we just said about the needle in the brain being like a... Mm -hmm. uh, a symbol of something. Mm -hmm. There's a literal needle being put into the brains of our children. I don't know if you, as a medical practitioner, have heard of adrenochrome. I have not heard that. Okay, you need to look up adrenochrome. I believe it's spelled A D R E N A C H R O M E. If not, the computer will get, get it for you. It's close enough. But adrenochrome is a chemical that can only be um, taken from the top portion of the brain. And they do it by inserting a needle to remove that fluid. That fluid is the stuff that geniuses are made of. And it's interesting. We started talking about that concept of genius. See how Allah does? He brings us full circle. So uh, right now, there are medical practitioners who secretly, not even secretly, they remove the adrenochrome because they sell it now as a product in the pharmacy that they claim helps to keep your skin tight and youthful looking. And, and it does. But that's why they're siphoning it from the brain, because when they, um, yeah, well, folks will understand this, there are cults around the world that remove the adrenochrome from infants particularly, but it can be from any young child, two years old, three years old, and they drink it as a ritual. They drink the blood containing the most adrenochrome that they have siphoned out of a child. And uh, the byproduct of siphoning that fluid is the death of the child. So a lot of the issues for, for child molestation, for child abuse, and for child abduction, especially all of these children on the milk cartons that we used to see, that's what that's about. And this thing has proliferated. Hear what I'm telling you. When you got a, um, a Rockefeller that lives to be 100 years old, you think he lived to be 100 years old just because he was eating healthy foods? No. That's a result of the intake of adrenochrome. When you cannot access that adrenochrome anymore, then you begin to revert back to what you would have been had you not come in contact with adrenochrome and you begin to become uh, wrinkly and all of these other things. And, you know, the proof of this was actually at the beginning of the COVID shutdown when people couldn't get access to adrenochrome because it has to be flown from overseas and the airplanes weren't flying. So we saw certain artists and certain uh, actresses and actors, who, none of whom I will name, it's not necessary, you can see literally in their faces that they were becoming old looking. So I'm saying that to point the attention now to what is actually happening to our children, to our babies. And this is not like a once in a while type of occasion. This is a phenomenon that is happening every day with children by the thousands around this country and around the world. And it's just the beginning 
to become a publicly known thing thanks to Jeffrey Epstein's island. Why does the judge not want to give up the names on the Jeffrey Epstein list of people who flew over to that island, especially if they've gone there more than once. And most of the celebrities and most of so-called Black Hollywood is on that list. So we're talking about a major exposure here. So now if this is the case and uh, an artist is on that list, your P. Diddy's are on there, that's already known. Even your Reverend uh, T.D. T. D. Jakes was visiting the island. See, so I'm saying to you people out there, before you judge Minister Farrakhan, you better look at some of these people that you've been admiring and following for years and decades. The ones that you thought were pure and pristine. I don't see Minister Farrakhan's name on the list. You understand? So these are people who are involved in pedophilia. We have to be able to talk about these, these topics because they affect us directly. These are people who are involved in incestual relationships, pedophilia. And I don't mean just with teenage girls. I'm talking about with young uh, uh, children, seven and eight and 12 years old, who are seen in pictures with Epstein and with Bill Clinton and all these other people who are pedophiles. I don't have to say allegedly. He's a pedophile. So the point is, is that these are the leaders that we have elected and selected to be over us, giving us advice on how to be a better human being. How is that? Like we said about uh, uh, Sigmund Freud, how, how can he give me advice on discipline? So I'm bringing that up as a subject because I'm going to be talking in depth about that going into this next semester, but it'll be on a separate platform and a separate webinar for that because a lot of people are just too sensitive for that and they, they can't, their brains can't take what I'm saying right now. All right. So um, it doesn't mean that it doesn't need to be said because it does need to be talked. About. It's going to be talked about. The list is due out. What is today? Today, <laughs> January 1. That's when. The, but all of the names that are on the list are not going to be given to the public. Mm -hmm. There are about 170 names that they're going to release today, but there are well over 300 people on that list who have visited that list 10 times, 16, 20 times in a two decade period of time. All right, so just stay on the lookout. It's going to hit you no matter whether you're interested in it or not. It's going, to, it's going to hit your ears and your eyes in a newspaper or in a magazine or in a television news program. It's going because they need for that to surface because we have been following these people blindly. And we have been following their lifestyles blindly. So even all of these rap, there's, there's only two rappers that are not on that list. And one of them is dead, Tupac. <laughs> and, uh, who is the other one? Uh, I forget who the other one is, but he's more of a positive rap artist. I'm talking the, the males now, not the females. It, name any other uh, artist who's out right now. All of them are on the list. Most of them are manifesting homosexual tendencies and promoting homosexuality. That's intended. That's a part of the scheme to keep us entangled to the point where we will never understand what this human life is truly about because we are not in touch with our human self. We're in touch with our animal self. And that's where they want us. That's what makes them the masters over us. That's what makes them the wolves and us the sheeple. So that was just a process note. We'll go back to something more pleasant from here. Uh, let me see. Um, I've written this down in case I didn't remember it, but I think we kind of covered everything about, except in the word, oh. So mm -hmm. if sometimes in Arabic, something ends in the letter T, like you were yesterday, you were talking about hind bent upa. So bent. Say, say it again. Remember, you were talking about hind bent upa when she is the one you, you said that was. Um, remember, she has. It was in 
not the Battle of, I forgot which battle it was. Oh, not the yeah. First. Yeah, you're saying Hind. I pronounce it Hind. Yeah, I got you. Oh, now. Yeah. Hind. Okay. Yeah. Hind bent. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so she's bent. And so she's a T. And then you talk about bat mitzvah versus bar yeah. mitzvah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, but why are some Arabic names like Ali and Aliyah? What's the ending of A mean? What does putting an A at the end? How does that make it female? Make it? Yeah, that's a great question. <clears throat> well, the letter A symbolizes uh, several things. The letter A is actually a feminine letter also, although the Arab grammarians don't know to tell you that. They know about the feminine T. They gave it a name, Ta Marbuta, the T that ties. Just like we talk about when a baby is born, if the woman doesn't want to have any more babies, she gets her tubes tied. Yeah, well, this, this Ta Marbuta ties this word to the next word. So just like you have the word Aya, you have the plural of that as Ayat with the ta marbuta, so that if I say something after that, like ayatul kursi, ayatul, see, ayat el kursi, then I, I don't have to have a break in between those words. I don't have to say ayat el kursi. I can just say ayatul kursi. So it makes it feminine. And it also makes that, uh, I'm talking now about the ta marbuta for a second. It makes the word that is attached to it uh, expansive. Oh. Yeah, because the female is seen as the true progenitor of new life, and she has to do it through the expansion of her belly section, pregnancy. So everything feminine, and it's the opposite of what we've been told, but everything feminine is actually in a superior position. The ovum is in a superior position to the sperm, Mama, if she's doing her mommy thing, she's in a superior position to the daddy. How many mother, how many fatherless homes do we have? And, and the children still turn out all right. Because the mother is on her fit of her job. Mm -hmm. So the universe is called the universe from the Sanskrit word yoni, which means vulva. So we're living in a yoni-verse. <laughs> the entire universe is a yoni that's producing. It's, it's always giving us new life. New ideas. The science has come out of the study of the universe. The male is an afterthought on the most part in the universe. He's a sideline security guard. <laughs> I know men don't like to hear that. But it's true. You're just from her. <laughs> you're, you're one of her many wishes for assistance. But when you look at these other words, if they end in that A sound, it's because they are also in a position to uh, to give a feminine principled level of assistance, although they don't give birth and they don't tie themselves to anything. But they're in a. You see the, the in English. Let's start with English. You have the English small letter A. In English, remember now that the small letters are the true alphabet. The capital letters are an invention by capitalized people. So they put them at the beginning of English words. They put them at, you know, the beginning of names, you know, nouns and that kind of thing. But the true English alphabet is, is represented by the, 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 the minimum, what they call the, um, the, the uh, minuscule letters. The large letters are called mas uh, majuscule as a majestic, they were talking about the majestic people. Other languages don't have that capital letter, small letter thing like English does. Now, the small a, I want you to think about it in Roman font in your head. Okay, so I know this is going to come up backwards when, it, when I look at it on YouTube, but we're talking about this sound that curves over from the top. This is how you actually write it. 
it curves over from the top. In fact, I can very quickly reproduce it. I got you got it. Yeah, yeah I, I I can I, do. I, I, can you do? Can you do it and show it? Because I want the audience. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, okay, no. that's what I'm going to do. Looking for it. See, every time I'm not looking for my magic marker, it magically appears. Okay, so you'll be able to see this. I forget to make how to make an English A. Oh. All right, if folks can see this, I think they can. Can you see that? No. No, it's I too could. Light. Yes, oh, I can yeah. see it now. It's I can see yeah, that light. now. Okay. Mm -hmm. So think about that. Almost like a circle with a with a tail mm -hmm. pulling to the left to the right. All right, so that circle, oh, I forgot a very important part of it, in the font. The top part. Yes. Can you see, okay. can you see that? Yes. All right. Oh, yes, I'm sir. looking at the wrong camera, that's one, okay. Yes, sir, I yeah, can see that. Yeah, you guys can see it now, okay, all right. Now that top part represents the bending over of the pregnant woman at the time of giving birth. You know, back in parts of Africa and other parts of the world that are not Europe-based, mm -hmm. Europeans introduced, as you know better than I do, the practice of laying down on your back and spreading your legs, mm -hmm. putting them in stirrups, and then pulling the baby out against gravity. Totally non fitra Whereas from our lands, Africa, Asia, and other places, Caribbean, we had the practice of stooping down the females to give birth, just like that letter A. See, that back part are her feet coming out from beneath her, behind her, pardon me, right? And she would be stooped down in pain. And that round part of that small letter A is the belly. So that letter came to represent new birth, new ideas. So begin to concentrate on those words that you're familiar with that end in A or E-A. These are what, what are called ligatures. I'm going to be teaching more on that going into this next semester because the language and letters alphabet, they're actually ligatures. They're symbols of things. The letter L, the letter R, the letter S, D, all of those are ligatures of shapes that are actually put together. The B is the straight line down, connected to the circle, the O. The, the L and the O put together produce both B and D, and L has a meaning, and the circle has a meaning. Now this is, Probably, not even probably, I know for sure, the most elevated level of learning letters and alphabet that anybody in my audience and probably in the general audience has ever come into. So I would petition you out there who are not a part of the university online learning course, the ship is about to be set from shore. But if you want to be sure about what you're learning, you need to join this course and you can do I'll have that information at the end of the video. But the point here is that all of them have these uh, various meanings and uh, denotations that we need to learn. Uh, the O being the same thing. You know, we have um, Julio and Julia. Mm -hmm. They're the same word. In the Fitra, there's no discrimination between masculine and feminine. They work together. We call Julio masculine and we call Julia feminine. But the A and the O in this case is representing pretty much the same thing. The only thing that makes the difference is when you have a T or a Tat Marabuta, that's a contrived feminine ending. These other ones are natural feminine endings. Mm. Yeah. 
because if I have the word fitra, that's actually a masculine word. But if I connect it to something via the use of the tamar buta, then it becomes fitra to law, the fitra of Allah. But fitra to to law. See, you have to add the, the feminine t. You're you're making it feminine. Isn't that a wonderful conversation in today's LGBTQ, LSG, MSG, uh, OSM, uh, TW? A language and world. Yeah. I have something. That's, my mother's family is from South Carolina. They're from uh, the capital of Buford and those islands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She's a Gulliper. Uh, I, I Gullah. guess. Yeah. He's a Gullah. Okay. Now, I have never heard when my mother finds out or when she found out that someone was pregnant. She would never say, when are you going to have the baby? You know what she would say? Mm. When you get down. Mm. She would say, when are you getting down? Kind of proves what I just said, doesn't it? Right. And I kind of, and I wondered, I said, why would she always say that? Because mm -hmm. I didn't hear anybody else say that. Uh, that's because I'm around my mother. But we were away from her family because my father was in the military. We're traveling. Yeah. She always, when she, and she, but when she was talking to her family, she would say, well, when is she getting down? When do you get down? And that's when you're going to have the baby. And, and it finally, and then this is why, because it's amazing. You actually get down and they were getting down. They have Literally. A sister here and a sister <laughs> yeah. here. Yeah. And you were getting down having your baby. Yes, yes, yes. So A also came to mean death. <laughs> yeah. And it's more typified in the capital English letter A, which is actually a symbol for the pyramid in Giza. Oh, okay. Okay. And that pyramid became our capital letter A, thanks to the Greek um, hmm. influence in ancient Egypt. And it was the place where they supposedly buried kings and pharaohs. Although we know it was also a place of great learning. They were, they were universities actually taking place in, in those uh, pyramids. But you had to be a master mover of the body to even get in there because it wasn't just walking through an open door. Right now, if you go visit those, those pyramids, if you're not in shape, you won't be able to go into the interior because you got to bow down, bend down, twist around feel your way through some chambers. So it was something that the higher ups in ancient Egypt uh, used as a symbol of their great power and glory as pharaohs or as kings and queens. And that was more so, it was more of uh, uh, an edifice for learning the secrets pertaining to knowledge. The ancient Egyptians were heavy and they were the original secret societies. There were those before them in Samaria and Babylonia and all those places, but ancient Egypt mastered the art of secret so secret knowledge and secret society, esotericism. That's why the masons and the shriners depend so heavily on Egyptian information and knowledge, because they didn't believe that knowledge was for everybody. They believed that certain levels of knowledge were for certain levels of people or certain people who needed to be initiated into that knowledge because they had specific roles to play in the society. If you didn't have a specific role and you were just one of those sheeple people, they weren't going to share that level of knowledge with you. And believe it or not, it's the same for the Quran. The Quran is not for everybody, despite what Muslims might teach on Juma. There's nothing in the Quran that says that the Quran and its wisdom is for everybody. No, it's for those who think. It's for those who use their reason. That's how the Quran approaches knowledge. For those who use the Akhtar, do they not use their reasoning is what Allah asks. Do they not yet tadabbaru the Quran? Do they not ponder deeply the Quran? Had it been from other than Allah, you would have found in it many discrepancies. So this is Allah's appeal to the human intellect. He's not appealing to the sheeple people, but they become benefited because of the residual effects of the knowledge that they are using to establish society. You're going to be a natural uh, kind of a... Uh, sideline inheritor of the benefits of that knowledge 
not because you're participating directly in understanding the knowledge, but because the people who are in charge of the knowledge are supposed to be righteous enough to make sure that they include you in their plans for upliftment. So you get it as a, as a residue. But great knowledge is uh, has never in the world been shared just freely out. You know, the Bible calls it throwing, uh, what do they call it, throwing pearls to swine. <laughs> you might have heard your parents say something like that. That the, Yeah, the Bible says that, that you're not supposed to throw pearls to swine. They're not going to know what to do with pearls. And a lot of these people out here don't know what to do with knowledge that we're teaching in my class. I know that what I'm teaching is not for everybody. I know it is for people who will investigate what I'm giving to them. And you'll either find flaws, which I will then correct if you can prove that it's a flaw or a mistake or misspoke or, uh, misspoke or something. I do it all of the time. They say, well, the Quran doesn't say that. And I go back and look for that verse I was thinking about. And if it ain't there, I come back and, and fix it in the video or wherever or in an email. I say, yes, sir, you're, you're absolutely right. That's not in there. Let's make this change. And I'll post it in the comment section. You know, you got to be humble enough to do that. We're not the all-knowing. See how big and bad we think we are. We are not the all-knowing. And there's always more room for us to grow. So that's what those uh, letters were speaking to. They were speaking to qualities and quantities and qualifications. That's why they call them characters. They call the letters characters because they have characteristics. Letters have personality. So when you're reading a word, you're reading sets of personalities. How the word works. And if it's put into a sentence, as we're able to do with newnetics, and tell you that three letters in a, word, in a word are not just a word as they are in Arabic, they're actually a sentence because each one of them is already a character that's speaking to you. Hmm. Yeah, so if I take um, ein, lam, mim, and put it together as a word, I get the word for knowledge, ilm. Science. But if I break those three letters down letter for letter, then ayin represents the eye or insight. Lam represents the tongue or communication. And meme represents the area of the belly where the acids are constantly churning because food is always being introduced. So if I put them all together, if I have my little child in the supermarket and they're trying to put everything they like into the shopping cart, I say, you can't do that. I say, he said, but mommy, I'm hungry. Okay, I get it. You're hungry. Okay. But you need to stop eating with your eyes. You've heard that. Yeah. They say, stop eating with your eyes. You're not really that hungry. You're eating it because you see it. Stop eating everything just because it's there. <laughs> People going to the restaurant hungry. They start ordering all kinds of a la carte, and, you know, and they, they end up leaving three quarters of it on the plate because they weren't really that hungry. Their eyes were making them think they were hungry, looking at it. Uh, they start to salivate. Uh, I got to have that. So ilm is the same thing when it comes to knowledge. Mm -hmm. Stop thinking you can ingest and digest everything because that other person can do it or knows it. So you you have a right to No, it's not like that. Tell people that when it comes to newnetics all the time. You're not going to know what Instructor Benjamin Bilal knows, but you can have a piece of my plate. I can show you how to chew on bits and pieces of this steak. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. Don't be disparaged because you can't get it yet. You haven't gotten it yet. It's not meant for you to get right now. Eating is incremental. That's what makes eating such a pleasure. You should have the colors that you like in your eating place, your kitchen or wherever you're eating, your dining room, you should have, you should be paying attention to the entire environment when you eat. Now we don't do that. We get our plate, we go up in the room, we kick on the game, turn on the game and, you know, we're not even thinking about how the food tastes. That was a requirement back in the days of etiquette, social etiquette, even in this country. You eat properly. You pick up the fork, you have a knife, you have a spoon or whatever. And you don't gulp things down. You don't eat and sip. You don't drink soda. 
you had a glass of water. And you didn't even drink that while you were eating. You drank that a little bit after you finished eating. And these are things that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us also. I tell you, he was a master. He told us what to eat, what not to eat, what to, you know, ingest, what to, what to stay away from. And much of what he gave us was also symbolic, especially when he was talking about the Navy beam. He was actually talking about the black man's brain, <laughs> how to make it more productive. Yeah, we used to believe in the Nation of Islam. I say we because I was there with my brother who did join the Nation of Islam back in the early 70s, 72, 73, 74, until 75. We used to believe that when the Great Famine came, mm -hmm. and it's still coming, might be here in 2024, when the mm -hmm. Great Famine comes and hits society, the only thing that's going to save you is if you have bags of Navy beans to cook. We still believe that. I know. <laughs> I've got jars and jars of navy beans. Yeah, all right. I My wife is the same because that those beans will save you in the event of uh, possible starvation. So if those you get a whole lot of navy bean brains together, you mm -hmm. can be saved. Don't throw navy. out the baby with the bathwater. Help your people. So that led to bean pie bean soup right right yeah i remember when all of these things were, were being well they were already in, 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 uh, introduced when i was a young guy you know i learned about them in the 70s 72 73 74 and i remember not eating bean pie for years because of the name bean pie. i said how can they make a pie out of beans how can they make a cake out of carrots you know i i didn't understand it so i deprived myself of that goodness for many years because of how it sounded. Bean pie? That's right. My brother, my brother brought home sacks. And Minister Farrakhan told us, he said, make sure you stock up on your beans, your white navy, I think they were white navy beans, right? And he said, because when the when the throwdown at the showdown comes, which he said was very, very uh, soon to come, he said, according to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, that it was going to be a great war of Armageddon, as they called it. And he said that you're going to have to take towels and stick them at the bottom of your door so the smell of your beans cooking won't attract people who try to rob you of your beans, of your soup. Right. He said, make sure you have towels at the bottom of the door so that the smell wouldn't mm -hmm. get out. Animals are passing, they're starving, you know, people are passing, they smell something. He said, you want to be able to protect yourself. Much, much wisdom in what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught that is still available for us to peruse and to learn from. But the primary focus for us as Muslims has to be and continue to be Al-Quran. And if we find something in the Quran that is diametrically opposed to anybody's information. We're not taking anybody as our God, our Allah, la ilaha illallah. So if it if it if it opposes or differs with drastically, I'm talking about, mm -hmm. then we have to make adjustments on what we accept as information. We don't have to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Is my point. The baby needs to grow and develop, but the bathwater mm -hmm. needs to go. So that's all Imam W.D. Muhammad did. He took the bathwater of his father's teachings and uh, other things that were going on, some of the activities that were going on that were not right. They were actually outright corrupt amongst his ministers, right? And he took that, and that's what he threw out. But he took the mind that was being developed and brought it into a more Islamic at atmosphere so that it, it could be it could grow based on that nutrition, Quranic nutrition. So that's where we are today. So I'll let you have the final word. Oh, okay. One of the first tapes that I, one of the first videos that I saw, you were speaking of the word Aleph. Mm -hmm. So I listened to it and then I went into the, then I Googled that to see if I could find more information. Mm -hmm. You know what I came up with? You know, many times when you Google something, 
you'll get something that's an ad, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and you, you don't get the scholarly stuff until later. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You know what I got? Okay, <laughs> I got A L I F. Aleph, right? Mm -hmm. What it came up was abdominal lumbar internal fusion. That's right. They've done that same thing throughout medicine. They've taken Arabic letters and turned them into meanings for each uh, for each letter. Yeah. I've seen that. Yeah. That's a kind of a surgery mm -hmm. on the back. And yes, they right. call it on, on the spine. That's right. I saw that recently, actually. And I said to myself, I wonder who was this doctor? Yeah. What is he a Muslim? He, uh, he had to be. <laughs> well, he was a Muslim or a Mason. <laughs> so my last yeah. thing I'd like to say is thank you for this session. We thank Allah. And I'm happy you were able to join me. I, I think I think I kind of made up for me missing our last meeting. I had forgotten that oh, we were supposed yeah. to meet, so I gave you two hours instead of one. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. And I just like to thank thank you for this information. And it's been very enlightening to speak to you today. I got some things cleared up. I got some things, I cleared up some things. Or yes, ma'am. Made, you know, so I'm very happy to be, and I did pay. I already paid for the next semester. I, I saw it. You know what I, I need to get, and you can text it to me. I have a, I have your name in my phone, but it's under another learner's. <laughs> it's his phone, and I don't know how that happened, because I tried to text you one time, and another oh. brother answered, and he said, no, I'm brother so-and-so. I'm not her, so. I don't know how I got them mixed up, but just text me your, your actual number so I can lock it into my phone. Do you want me to put it in the chat? No, 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 no. Don't put it oh, in the chat. No, I'll, put I'll it, just, just I'll send just it to me. It. Text it to me. Yeah. Okay. Can I put it in the email? You can. Yeah. You can email okay, it to me. It yeah. Email. I just don't want it floating around in the public. Right. Okay. I'll put it in the email. So we have to protect you, our brother. sisters. Sister. Thank you. That's All right. right. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you so much, brother. And so I. Uh, Let's do it again. Yes, this is really twice a month at least. Fascinating. Yeah, and then it, sometimes I'll I'll add a third person just to mix it up a little bit. Yeah, good. Okay. Right? But you are so wonderful, a soul. Just your spirit yeah. just exudes sophistication and Thank intelligence. You. Credit to Allah. All yes. praise and credit right. to Allah. Thank Enjoy you. the rest of this beautiful day. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Salam alaikum. Okay.